Well, howdy, everybody. This is John Michael Talbot. No, Moses is not with you. Kids, <laughs> Gandalf ain't here. And you TV watchers, the guys from Duck Dynasty aren't here with you either. We're going to be talking about Monk Dynasty, how to bring this ancient way into today's world in a way that's fun and engaging. See you back here. All things are possible with God. Well, howdy, everybody. This is John Michael. We're going to be looking at Monk Dynasty. No, not Duck Dynasty, <laughs> not Gandalf, not Moses, but a monastic dynasty that goes all the way back to the early days of Christianity and how that is engaging and fun, even a little fun, for today. When we think of monks, sometimes we think of very wooden figures, don't we? Hoods up, you know, looking very serious, all the time. <laughs> or uh, maybe we do think of the guys from Duck Dynasty, but monks and sisters called nuns, we get the word from nunus, which is Latin for grandmother, uh, they're regular people. They're called to an extraordinary life, but they're really very ordinary people, and they come from the East and the West. Some of them are contemplative, some of them are active. We're going to be going through the whole history. Now, why do we call this monk dynasty? The word for dynasty usually implies a blood family and a blood leadership, a rulership that is blood related. Well, how can we call monasticism or Christianity a dynasty? But there is blood, isn't there? Let's look at some of the scriptures. We are saved, huh, to use the old language, by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. If we look at 1 Corinthians 10, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The blood of Christ. Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. In him we have redemption by his blood, the forgiveness of our transgressions, in accord with the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us. Wow. So, redemption... Forgiveness is through the blood of Christ. In the Eucharist, we drink, we share sacramentally in the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is truly present. And Ephesians chapter 2 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have become near, near by the blood of Christ. Well, what's this all about? What's this blood business? You know, I mean, they understood this in the time of, of Christ and in the old days because religions practiced blood sacrifice. They sacrificed animals. Some of the more uh, extreme religions even sacrificed children and virgins. And all. What's this all about? Why does humanity do this? What, what do we get it? Is it some kind of magical thing? No. Leviticus 17 says, since the life of a living body is in the blood, I have made you put it on the altar so that the atonement might thereby be made for your own lives, because it is the blood as the seed of life that makes atonement. See, love, love for God, for others, is a sacrifice of self for the sake of another. So the blood, the blood of Christ, is all about that love gift. We know John chapter 15, verse 13 says, No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Wow. How cool is that? So it's all about love. It's not about some weird, bloody thing. And, you know, we don't sacrifice animals in most religions nowadays, so it seems very foreign to us. So we have to kind of rediscover. It's about self-sacrifice. You know, we are like kids playing out in the street. <laughs> Mom and Dad said, don't go in the street. We were playing in the yard, and the ball went in the street. We went out in the street. 
And mom and dad looked out in the street and they saw us, the children they love, in the street. And what we couldn't see is a truck coming. So they run out in the street, they push us out of the way, and they're willing to get hit by that truck themselves for the sake of their children. See, that's love. That is the sacrifice of love. So the blood of Christ creates, as it were, a dynasty of leadership, of rulership, that comes all the way down to us today. We know that God, uh, it is a family, isn't it? The, our spirituality is a family. God is called Father. We pray the Our Father who art in heaven. Some theologians and scholars say this is the unique, one of the unique characteristics of the teaching of Jesus. Yeah, God being Father had been alluded to already in the prophets, but in a very special way, Jesus addresses God as Father. Jesus himself is the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. So God is Father. Jesus is the firstborn. He's the oldest brother. We're a family, aren't we? And that continues with the apostles. St. Paul the Apostle, for instance, he says that he, there, you have many teachers, but only one Father. And he's not talking about God the Father. He's talking about himself. Jesus says, don't call anyone Father but God the Father. It doesn't mean that nobody is to be a spiritual father. Nobody, he said, don't call anybody a teacher. But one of the gifts of the Spirit is teaching, isn't it? So it doesn't mean there aren't teachers. It doesn't mean there aren't fathers. It means that we realize that all these gifts come primarily from God the Father. But St. Paul calls himself a spiritual father to the communities that he helps to found. And he calls himself, in other places, he intimates that he is a spiritual mother. He says, you put me back into labor pains when the kids are acting stupid. <laughs> so St. Paul is a good example of a spiritual father. The monastic fathers and mothers indeed are in language called an abbot or an abbess, an abbe or an ama means a spiritual father or mother. We know that there is indeed apostolic succession. When we look to Ephesians chapter 9, verse 21, or excuse me, verse 19 through 22, it says, members of the household of God, that's us, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. Through him, the whole structure is held together and grows into a temple sacred to the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So this dynasty, if you will, builds on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone. He's the one who holds it together. The Spirit holds it together. But that fundamenta in Latin, that foundation is on the apostles and the prophets. We come along, we have to set our stone squarely on what's come before. We don't lean to the right, too conservative, the wall will fall. We're not too far to the left, too liberal, the wall will fall. We build squarely on what's come before, but we have to boldly put our stone where no stone has gone before. Kind of like Star Trek, see? So nobody's ever put a stone where we are but we build on what's come before. That's, that's the, the building of this dynasty. And 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, come to him, Jesus, a living stone rejected by human beings, but chosen and precious in the sight of God. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God the Father. So, we are living stones. We're part of this. So the whole notion of dynasty really does apply to monasticism and to Christianity in general. Keep in mind, uh, as we shift from secular humanism, or from a Judeo-Christian moral base to a secular humanist base, that we also have some challenges. For instance, in homeowners associations all around America, Religious communities of brothers and sisters, huh? religious brothers, religious sisters, are being thrown out and challenged by homeowners associations because they say they're single family homes. You guys aren't a single family. But as these cases are being brought to the courts in the United States, 
uh, the judges so far are siding with the religious communities, religious communities of priests or brothers or of sisters. We face that ourselves in Houston, but we are a spiritual family. So when we come back, we're going to be looking at the word monk. So we've looked at the word dynasty, dynasty, and we see that indeed this monastic teaching and Christianity in general is a dynasty that comes to us right now in our day, in our time. Let's never, are, are you aware of the power of the blood of Christ in your, are you aware that Jesus has given his life for you? Are you aware that you're part of a spiritual family? Jesus, I open myself to the power of your blood and being part of your spiritual family in Christ. Amen. I love you guys. See you back here in a second. Thanks. In remembrance of me This is my body In remembrance of me This is my blood Drinks this cup of salvation, shall not die but shall live, shall live forever. For his flesh is real food, and his blood real drink. of this bread shall live forever strengthened by heavenly bread strengthened by bread of angels the cup of salvation reigns come all Come humbly bow and adore Before the mystery of mysteries Under creation's form Yet the creator of all Within flesh yet not enclosed Incarnate and transcendent Consumed by all yet not destroyed Received by all and adored Howdy, everybody. This is John Michael Talbot. We are looking at Monk Dynasty. In the first part, we looked at dynasty and how, indeed, in the blood of Christ, we become a dynasty and a spiritual family, and that was passed on to the monks. This part of the program, we want to look at the word monk, and we want to look at the word wilderness, alone. So let's go through some of this, and we're going to see how this applies to us today. Isn't that cool? So the first word is a, is a word in Greek, Monos, and we get it in Scripture <clears throat> if we look at Matthew 14, 23. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. And the word there is manas, manas in Greek. It means alone. It appears in other places anytime the word alone is there, but but in a special way, it has significance with praying in solitude by yourself. Another word that's interesting is the word solitude, desert, or wilderness. So let's say that again. Solitude, wilderness, or desert. And the word there is eremos. Eremos. Say that with me. Eremos. And we see it in lots of places. Matthew 3, verse 1 and this is regarding John the Baptist, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, in the Eremos, the desert of Judea. 
Matthew 3, 3 says, For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The word for wilderness there is eremas. It's also used of Jesus in various places, but some special places is in Matthew 4, 1, with the temptation of Jesus. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness, the eremas, the desert, to be tempted by the devil, to do spiritual battle, to go through his own kind of trial and, and cleansing, even though he didn't carry sin, but he had to be prepared before he could go out and do ministry. Luke 5.15 says, The report about him spread all the more, and great crowds assembled to listen to Jesus, and he cured them of all their ailments. But, get this, so he was, he was very popular. There were great crowds pressing in on him all the time. But he would withdraw to deserted places to, play, to pray. The word deserted places, again, in the Greek is eremas. So we see this pattern. Jesus was alone and praying in solitude before the major events of his whole career. He was alone praying in solitude. He would often take three guys with him to help provide that environment to protect him. And he did it before he chose the twelve. He did it before, during the transfiguration in Matthew 17. He also went into the Garden of Gethsemane before his passion, before his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. So we see Jesus going over and over, even though he's very busy in ministry, going into places of time and times of solitude, silence, a place where he could be alone with God. So that's an important lesson for you and me. We must also do the same thing. See, the monks, the manas, who go into solitude, are speaking to all of us. We must also go into solitude, into silence. We must sometimes go away and be by ourselves to get prepared to go back out into the world of this frenetic activity that is part and parcel of modern American living. To come over here today to do this TV shoot, I had to drive on the, on the freeways of Southern California. It was frenetic. And the guy who was driving me, he was really frenetic. <laughs> so, and so we all have to take our time in solitude to get, to get centered, to get focused for the day. And it's the only way we can survive. So these guys have a great lesson to really teach us. Well, you know, there's a human impetus towards monasticism. Monasticism is not exclusively Christian. If you look, is there, there are pre-Christian examples of it. There are the therapeute in Egypt, and the therapeute uh, is where we get the word therapy. It also kind of comes from the word uh, Theravada, from the Buddhists, because we know that the Buddhist monks had made their way mm, as early as six, the 6th sixth century BC, they had made their way into Egypt. So there was this emphasis in Egypt of going into times of solitude and silence. In the Jewish community, we know we had the Essenes who lived in Qumran, and they were kind of a, a pre-Christian uh, monastic example. These were folks that went off into the desert went off to live an ascetic lifestyle to get more serious about their faith. And so in the Jewish faith, we have the Essenes. That's before Jesus. That's before Christianity. And of course, the Buddhists and the, and the Hindus, and even if you look to Taoism, you see men and women who would go off into solitude to have a mystical experience of spirituality, and then they would have something to share. So the, the monastic experience isn't exclusively Christian. It's a human, I think, a human religious impulse. And Jesus baptizes that, if you will, so that it is now used in a more complete and a more perfect way in Christianity. As much as we love and respect other monastic traditions, the Christian tradition of Christianity is, is pretty unique because of the place of Jesus in it. So. Now, this thing didn't just kind of plop down out of thin air. Indeed, it grew up from the lived experience of the early church. We see already that uh, parthenos is a word in Greek that means virgin. So we see the virgins already being honored 
in Christian tradition. 1 Corinthians 7, 36. You know, all through 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is treating uh, how to approach virgins. He says, if anyone thinks he's not behaving properly towards his betrothed, if his passions are strong, and, and it has to be, let him do as he wishes, let him marry, it is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So that he who marries his betrothed does well. So marriage is good. But he who refrains from marriage will do better. So there was already a tendency in Christianity, and this was really countercultural to Jewish, Jewish thinking, that there was a tendency to honor celibacy and to honor virginity. There was also a great tendency to honor widows. So when your, when your uh, husband, in the case of a widow or a widower, or your wife would die, you were strongly in the early church kind of, kind of encouraged to keep as you were, not to remarry necessarily. So in 1 uh, Titus 5.3, or 1 Timothy 5.3, he says, honor widows who are real widow widows. If a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn their religious duty to their own family and make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable. She who is a real widow is left alone and has set her hope on God and continues in supplications. So we see that this, this tendency began to grow and eventually it gave birth to people going into the desert and staying as solitude, in solitude, as celibates and as virgins. And we see it really happening in Palestine and in Egypt. In Egypt, there were different patterns. We're going to look at these in the next program on Egypt. The patterns were this. Hermits who lived in loose colonies, people who lived in community, and, and it was very strict and very formal, and they also became bases for ministry. So the question for us today, is really this. Do we, you and me, are we living manas for God and God alone? That's the question. Are we taking time for eremas? Are we going into solitude and silence to pray, to really do our Lectio Divina, to do our devotions, to have that place of communion so that we can go back out into ministry into today's very busy world. So let's make sure we know that we're part of a dynasty under the blood of Christ, and let's go as monos to be alone into the deserts, if you will, to pray, to be ready to minister Jesus to this hungry, hurting world. Jesus, help us to know the power of your blood. Jesus, help us to truly take time to be alone with you every day so that we find our focus and we are able to minister you to everyone we meet. All things are possible with God. See you back here next time for Monk Dynasty. Bye-bye. Come home little children come home come home to stay come home to a father who loves you come home to a mother who prays oh you heavy laden who carry the burdens of life cast your cares upon him for his yoke is easy and his burden light come home home little children come home come home to stay Come home to a father who loves you. Come home to a mother who prays. All whose soul is thirsty.
leather sting Come drink of the water of life All whose soul is hungering He is the bread of life Come home Come home Come children come home come home to stay come home to a father who loves you come home to a mother who prays come home to a mother who prays come home 